Welcome everyone around the world to this Noxos live Q&A. Uh, we've just heard the New York Virtuoso Singers performing uh, with conductor Harold Rosenbaum. Uh, my special guest today um, for this Q&A is William McClelland, the composer of that piece of music titled Hail Lovely and Pure. Uh, it's from his brand new album, Where the Shadow Glides, out now and available through any channel where you can buy or stream music. Uh, this Michigan-born, New York area-based composer, record producer, environmentalist, on and on, multi-hyphenate, uh, is our guest today talking about the music on Where the Shadow Glides and the life and career experiences that have inspired him as he goes about this project. Uh, William, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and yeah. we... We hope you're enjoying the success of your album so far. Well, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I um, gotten very good feedback so far, and um, I look forward to uh, to that to, to build to building it up. Certainly. Well, uh, we'll we'll do our best here. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you for discussing the new album with us, uh, which represents years of your career. You know, so many projects and so many genres from choral to art song, um, all the way to solo piano music. Um, how did this particular recording project come about for you? Well, um, the project actually came about gradually uh, over the period of uh, several years, uh, kind of like the music. Um, I, I had a variety of music. I had three choral works, a number of songs for voice and piano, and a work for solo piano. And um, these were kind of ready to be recorded. And um, uh, I had some wonderful artists who were willing and able and ready to, to do this. So uh, we recorded the choral works uh, in two different sessions, um, the two a cappella pieces in 2016, um, and then Cadman's Hymn, which is for chorus and organ, in 2019. Um, and they're all, as you said, they're all with Harold Rosenbaum and the uh, New York Virtuoso Singers. Um, the organist on Cadman's Hymn is David Enlow. Um, and then the solo piano pieces uh, were recorded by Blair McMillan in 2017. And the songs with uh, mezzo-soprano Krista River, baritone uh, Thomas Miglioranza, and pianist Donald Berman uh, were all recorded in 2019. Um, and you know, while I hadn't necessarily intended it this way, uh, after everything was sort of completed, I looked at what we had and realized that it might work as a as a full CD. Um, and I also thought it would be nice to have a a recording um, with a variety of ensembles, not just, you know, not just all songs, all, you know, one thing. Um, so uh, and then with the piano work, uh, piece and the, then the solo uh, songs, it, it just seemed to fit nicely um, together. Um, and then I guess the other unifying factor uh, to the recording, other than it being just by one composer, me, uh, is that the producer and the engineer uh, for all of the music is uh, Adam Abe's house, who is one of the truly amazing uh, producers and, and engineers. So that that's sort of how it came to pass. Well, thank you so much uh, for sharing that sort of backstory with us. Uh, it's pretty clear that uh, you're drawing on uh, a lot of relationships, um, good relationships with both collaborators, you know, musicians, um, production team, uh, but also inspirations from uh, the past, poets often, um, who have inspired you in uh, this project. So uh, I wonder if you'd like to go into a little bit more detail about some of the artists you work with on one hand and on the other hand, um, some of the, the artists who have inspired you most, um, who you are not able to collaborate directly with. Right. Well, um, you know, to talk a little bit about the uh, the poetry and the and that, um, it, you know, the works represent a, 
variety of genres, um, choral works uh, to the piece for solo piano to the songs. Um, but uh, as you noted that the, the one unifying element really is, is poetry. Um, the songs have been, uh, they've been written over the course of many years. And uh, though I've written two song cycles uh, before for singers with uh, chamber ensembles, these are all solo songs for, for voice and piano. And uh, the texts are mostly by uh, 20th century Americans, um, several well-known poets uh, like Elizabeth Bishop, uh, William Carlos Williams and Hart Crane, and uh, then three British poets, um, two very well-known, uh, one Philip Larkin and one, uh, and John Betjeman, who are kind of famous British poets. And then there's one by a, a woman named Catherine Kursop, uh, who I think is almost completely unknown. Uh, I found a poem of hers uh, in a diary that uh, was kept by my maternal grandmother. Um, she used to cut out uh, poems and articles that she liked from newspapers and magazines. And uh, I found this beautiful poem in, in, in her book. And I don't think she, uh, the poet ever had any, any collections or was it maybe just a few poems, but it was this absolutely beautiful poem. Um, uh, there's also a song by a living poet, uh, a friend of mine named Spencer Appling, and it's called The Politician. And, um, and there's one by Lydian Emerson, who uh, was actually the second wife of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And this was re a poem reprinted in a book, uh, a biography I'd been reading of, of Emerson. And um, it's this beautiful love poem uh, called uh, Poem Composed in Sleep. Um, and, um, and then there's one by uh, a wonderful American poet called W.S. Merwin called uh, Memory of Summer Facing West. Uh, and this is a poem I just happened to read in the New Yorker magazine years ago. And just a very short poem, but it's it just staggeringly beautiful. And I just, I, you know, I read this and then I ran over to the piano and started to, to, <laughs> to, to write, a, write a song about it because it was just so, so beautiful. Um, and then the choral works, um, these are all uh, kind of the first two are uh, early English texts, very early English texts. Uh, Cadman's hymn was is a seventh century uh, text, and it's fa in fact it's the oldest surviving written English uh, in existence. Um, it's the earliest written English that there is, and um, uh, I used the translation by a, an American writer named uh, Burton Raphael. Um, to set it. And then the second uh, choral piece, which we listened to a little bit at the beginning, called Hail Lovely and Pure, uh, is a setting of, it's a short fragment from a 15th century English work called the she Second Shepherd's Play. And um, th this is one of what were called mystery or miracle plays. And these are medieval dramas written uh, and they would travel around and perform these, and they were written about biblical subjects like uh, the creation or the last judgment. And um, this very short fragment talks about the moment when uh, the shepherds arrive in, in Bethlehem to praise the newly born Christ child. Um, and these two pieces uh, were actually inspired uh, by calligraphy that to my late brother, uh, David C.K. McClelland, who was an amazing calligrapher. Uh, he did versions of these pieces and I, and I set those to music. Um, and then the third choral work, the last piece on the album is called These Last Gifts. And uh, this one is set to a first century BC uh, poem. It's an elegiac poem by a Roman author named Catullus. Uh, and I wrote this piece in, in my brother David's memory. Um, and then uh, finally, the, the, the short pieces for piano, as I mentioned, they're not settings of actual uh, texts to be sung, uh, but they were inspired by five different poems. And um, 
there's there, but they're really more just kind of interpretations and uh, impressions uh, that I have of the text. Um, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the artists involved, um, all I can say is that I am, feel so fortunate to be working with these this, these people. Uh, the New York virtuoso singers uh, are legendary. They're, uh, as is their founder and conductor, Harold Rosenbaum. I, I think they're celebrating their 35th or so anniversary this year, uh, and it, this is just truly one of the premier choral ensembles in, in the world. Uh, Harold also conducts the Canticum Novum Singers in New York. Uh, he has a conducting institute. He's an author, and, and he has just done so much uh, to promote and perform uh, new American choral music. I mean, he's just a, a gift. Um, and then the organist on Cadman's hymn, David Enlow, he is the uh, music director of the Park Avenue Synagogue and the Church of the Resurrection in Manhattan. And he's made many recordings. Um, the pianist uh, for Five for Piano is Blair McMillan, uh, an extraordinary musician uh, here in New York City. Blair, uh, actually, he's on a number of Noxos recordings. I think he's on seven Noxos recordings. <laughs> Uh, and these include a recent one of uh, the composer Joan Towers, a wonderful piano concerto. Um, and the artists, the artists on the songs uh, also include uh, mezzo soprano Krista River, who is she's based in Boston, and she has two Noxos recordings as well. Uh, she actually won a Grammy for her performance of uh, a recording of. Uh, opera by Tobias Picker. Um, Thomas Miglioranza, the baritone, he has two other recordings also on Noxos of music by Louis Karchin, and he is a wonderful singer. Uh, and the pianist on the songs uh, is, is uh, the incomparable Donald Berman. Uh, Don performs, of course, on the uh, wonderful recording of Scott Wheeler's songs uh, on Noxos with, with Krista. Uh, but Don is also one of the great interpreters of uh, both Charles Ives and Carl Ruggles, two early American composers who are uh, really my musical, two of my musical heroes. Uh, so to have Don perform my songs, it, it's just such an honor. Um, and I also have to mention that he is the head of the piano department at the Longy School of Music in Cambridge, uh, which happens to be my alma mater. So that's a nice connection. And um, and finally, again, I just have to mention Adam Abe's house, who uh, another Grammy award-winning uh, producer and engineer, um, and possibly the most amazing pair of ears I've just about ever encountered and he hears literally everything. He is a, just amazing. And so I just feel truly blessed uh, that these amazing artists felt my music was worthy of their their time and attention. And I'm, uh, I'm just very grateful. Well, we're grateful to you. Uh, for those who are just joining us, uh, welcome into the Noxos live Q&A with composer and many other things. Uh, William McClelland, we're talking about his new album out now, uh, Where the Shadow Glides. And we've just heard a little bit about uh, some of his influences in the arts, some of the close collaborators that he worked with uh, creating this recording project. Uh, William, thanks so much for sharing with us today. Um, you just mentioned the producer on this project um, the, the best pair of ears in town. Um, but you yourself have worked well beyond uh, composition in your life. Um, and your musical projects have taken you in many directions, including record production. Um, and it shows on this album, I think. Um, uh, listeners who experience this album for the first time, and I hope plenty of you out there get that chance soon, um, will notice the the good balance, the great acoustics on this album, um, which of course are factors that come partly from uh, the production. And uh, the sequencing of the tracks also really struck me, William, when I first heard this record, um, because there are these three choral pieces that sort of serve as bookends 
um, welcoming you in through this sort of uh, very primal, very um, sort of evocative music on Cadman's hymn, this medieval text. Um, and then we are given this gorgeous, glorious, but also, you know, slightly melancholic um, farewell in the form of the Catullus poem at the end. Um, and so there are these bookends, but there's also this central choral piece um, that we'll hear a little bit more about uh, in the near future. So um, the, the sequencing is also interesting in that poems that you set um, that become art songs on this album um, sometimes occur back to back, uh, directly adjoining each other. Um, and that thematic connection really comes out through the sequencing. So. Uh, let's listen to a couple of those, actually. Um, so the first song we're going to hear here is called Autumnal. Uh, it's a setting of poetry by James Arlington Wright, uh, sung by Mezzo Krista River. And uh, then right after that, we're going to hear a poem called, or a song called Autumn 64, um, in which uh, this baritone, Thomas Meliranza, um, sings text by the British poet John Betjeman. Uh, Donald Berman's the pianist on both tracks. Uh, let's listen to these two evocations of autumn um, set by William McClelland right now. Soft weather shadow glides, the yellow pears fell down. Ah, 
half an hour a day of days will climb into its golden height and Sunday bells will ring its praise the sparkling flint the darkling you Intensely red than hawthorn berries, bright with dew. Or leaves of creeper still unshed, the watery sky washed clean and new, are all rejoicing with the dead. you just joining us again. Welcome to this Noxos live Q&A uh, with composer William McClelland. Uh, we've just heard two songs from his uh, recent album, Out Now. Um, that was uh, Autumnal, sung by Krista River with pianist Donald Berman, and then Autumn 1964 uh, with Berman at the keys again, and uh, baritone Thomas Miller Ronza. Uh, there's so much contrast between those two settings, and yet we get this autumnal imagery and this autumnal feel from both of them, um, just in different ways. And uh, we're talking a little bit about what it takes to put an album together, choose how the tracks fit and how they might comment on each other. Um, you've worked as a producer, William, um, and you're certainly free to talk more about that work. Um, when you're choosing how to present your own music um, on record, uh, do you follow any sort of guiding philosophy for that? Or uh, is it more instinctive, a bit of both? Well, yeah. Um, you know, when, when I was trying to put together the uh, order for uh, this recording, um, I had a number of issues to deal with, um, particularly because of the different types of uh, music and ensembles. Um, Altogether, the album includes 15 relatively short songs for uh, voice and piano. Um, there's a set of the five short solo piano pieces and then the three choral works. And um, one of the choral works, Hail Lovely and Pure, is considerably longer than the other pieces on the album. Uh, it's almost 14 minutes. And, and it felt to me like it really should be the centerpiece of, of the album. Um, and there's also the nine, nine minute choral work Cadman's Hymn, which really seemed like the perfect uh, opener. Uh, you know, it begins very quietly uh, with long silences. Um, four of the chorus members uh, speak the first uh, line of the text in Old English, uh, and it unfolds kind of very slowly. And I thought of Cadman's Hymn you know, almost like the album's overture. Uh, um, and then the recording's last piece um, is uh, this a cappella choral uh, work called These Last Gifts. And uh, the text by Catullus, it describes the death of his brother and how he traveled uh, great distances uh, to attend his brother's funeral rites. And uh, I also lost a brother at an early age and this poem spoke so powerfully to me. Um, 
and I think of the piece almost, I guess, as a, a, a kind of a mini requiem. Um, and I felt it, it definitely was the work that should end the album. Um, and so I now, now I had the three choral works as you and as you described them so well, bookends and and one the, the central focal point and. And then I began thinking about the songs and the piano pieces and where they should be. Um, and the songs are almost evenly divided uh, between Krista and Tom. And it didn't make sense to me to have all the mezzo songs and all the baritone songs together as, as groups. But then I also didn't want them just to kind of alternate, you know, back and forth. Um, so I, I really thought carefully and I decided to present them more or less in pairs um, with, with two songs by one singer and, and then two by another, although it didn't totally strictly adhere to that, but, but in general like that. Um, and then I felt the songs, once I had those two groups, they should be, uh, I put them in two groups and I thought that one should possibly come right after the first uh, choral piece, uh, and then the second group right before the final choral piece. Um, it, it just seemed that just seemed to work, and uh, and then I then I needed to decide where the piano pieces would would go, and it seemed just very natural that they would come after the this long central choral work, um, kind of like a you know a little fresh difference, very very different, you know. Um, and then there was finally there was the actual uh, question of choosing the order of the songs, um, and I did this, I guess, in a fairly conventional way. Uh, I looked at the the subject matters, of the the text, the character, the styles, the the tempo of uh, the various uh, pieces, and and but you know ultimately, as you suggested, it it does come, come came down to instinct, really. I mean, you know, I spent a lot of time listening and thinking and adjusting everything. And, you know, I hope I found the right balance and, uh, you know, a way to make the album work seamlessly a, a, as a whole. Uh, you know, there's a fair amount of music here. Uh, you know, it's almost an hour and 13 minutes. So, you know, I'm hoping that this uh, variety of styles and ensemble types will, will keep it fresh for, for listeners. Yeah, so often you get CDs these days and there's like 35 minutes of music on there and they were designed to hold so much more than that and this this takes you on a journey and gives you a lot to think about and to enjoy um so thank you for talking a little bit about that um that aspect of putting together an album uh one of the factors you called out um in talking about the sequencing and the overall sort of vision of the album was poetry and uh this is an interest that i think uh, you and I share this moment in the early 20th century when poets were really trying to do something new. And uh, some of the ones who really succeeded were these poets who were labeled by themselves sometimes, by the press sometimes, as imagists. Uh, and this word, um, which derives from the word image, like trying to give you a clear image of something, um, they were really trying to use this very precise language and wording um, and very concise phrases to get you to a specific scene or idea. And uh, one of the poets you set uh, multiple times on this record uh, is a woman named uh, Hilda Doolittle who wrote under the pen name HD. Um, and she was really a leading light in this little movement. Um, and what comes out of it in her work a lot of the time, especially in the poems that you've set here, um, is that you get this image of nature and it's really highly charged with emotion. Um, so a tree fell in my own front yard uh, the other week. Um, so I've experienced this directly, but uh, there's this song, Storm, um, where you've set the words of HD writing about a tree sort of snapped and decimated by, you know, sort of a, a weather occurrence. And so uh, Meli Ronza is the baritone soloist in this with uh, Donald Berman on the piano part. Uh, so this is an art song about a storm set by one of these early 20th century poets. Um, so let's listen now to Storm uh, by William McClelland and see how this shakes out musically. 
And so we're left on this sort of cliffhanger almost where, you know, the tree's clearly been hurt, but is it down? Is it destroyed? We kind of don't know. And uh, you kind of give us a musical cliffhanger there too. At least I hear it that way. Um, when, when you're setting poems like these that are so evocative, um, do you find yourself trying to uh, match the writer's imagery in sound, or are you sort of commenting on a poem in other ways? Yeah, um, well, in terms of setting poems in general to music, you know, how I approach it, it definitely obviously just depends on the type of poem. I mean, for example, with uh, this poem by HD, you know, it's, it's straightforward, you know, you're not you, you know exactly what's going on, you know, every every minute. And um, and this is also true of uh, talking about the these, this imagist thing, the William Carlos Williams, who was sort of part of that group. Uh, the two poems of his, the, de the defective record, the one we listened to, and another one called Labrador. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to write music which, you know, to a certain extent uh, matches matches the imagery of the poem. I mean, doing what I guess, you know, you would naturally just kind of call word painting. I'm not trying to be too, uh, you know, working against type necessarily. Um, you know, in the, in, in the case of Storm and several others where they're, the meaning is, is very clear, I really do try more or less to depict the poem in music. Um, but I'm not really, you know, it's not absolutely uh, you know, strict about this. It's it's a difficult process, you know, to to describe at least for me how I would set a particular line or phrase. I mean, um, even with uh, relatively uncomplicated poems, there are often lines or phrases uh, that that have abstract elements or phrases that can be interpreted in in different ways. So I guess I'll often you know, just find the rhythms and sounds of the words that suggest certain musical ideas and let them take me where they, they you know, they want to go. Um, but it's not easy, you know, I guess, because I usually don't, I don't usually have the piece, particular piece planned out always from start to finish. I mean, I'll begin and the actual form may start to become clear uh, immediately, or I might not know what it is until uh, it's almost over with. And so I say it's a little difficult to describe, but it is such an extremely enjoyable and interesting experience, the, the actual doing of it. I mean, that's, you know, what what makes it uh, worthwhile. I mean, and, and when you hit that sweet spot, you know, with, with, in a piece where you know, it really seems to have gelled and, and come together. Um, there's really nothing like it. Um, I hope that makes some kind of sense. <laughs> well, I think it did. Um, yeah, no, these, uh, these writers early in the 20th century or, you know, really throughout, you, you draw from so many um, 
especially Americans, especially in the 20th century. But, you know, there's a there's a broad spectrum recommend, um, represented on your album um, really are trying to, to get at something. So, you know, so emotionally laden. There's this William Carlos Williams poem where the entirety of it is so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. And that's the entire text. Um, and it's just this commentary on how, you know, a, an everyday sight can really take you somewhere. Right. And going on about Williams and about sort of natural settings, um, you are also a self-described active environmentalist. And uh, there's one album on, there's one song on the album rather, um, which you uh, sort of single out in your very helpful and eloquently put liner notes, by the way. Um, this song called The Defective Record, which is based on another William Carlos Williams poem. Uh, and this one is a little bit more explicit than some of the other poems you set about addressing ecological destruction. And this was written long before anyone knew of climate change or anything like that. Um, but it's certainly about sort of clear cutting natural settings in order to uh, sort of build on top of them, right? Um, and the, the narrator of this poem is so angry and you can feel that anger in your setting. Um, in this song, The Defective Record, um, there's this repeated phrase, on to build a house, on to build a house, on to build a house. Uh, and the singer actually cuts off and speaks at one point, right? Yeah. Um, so let's hear that song. Um, we're going to hear now uh, The Defective Record, based on a text by William Carlos Williams, um, music by William McClelland. <laughs> including even the muskrats. Who did it? There's the guy, him in the blue shirt and turquoise skull cap. Level it down for him to build a house on, to build a house on, to build a house on, to build a house on. To build a house on. And, and there it is. Uh, you know, there's this clearly sort of environmentalist statement by um, a, a poet who saw the, you know, increasing development of urban areas, um, such as New York, uh, firsthand at a time when a lot of uh, the country around him was still agricultural or, you know, just sort of left to be whatever it was before, right? Uh, and so, uh, so many of the poems you set on this album, William, um, foreground landscapes and non-human inhabitants of landscapes. Um, so do you notice yourself sort of composing with an environmentalist sensibility in mind? Yeah, I, 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 I do. I, um... You know, it's interesting. I actually, I actually began to be conscious of what humans were doing to the environment pretty early on. Um, you know, I remember growing up the, the ads for "Keep America Beautiful." You know, about how bad littering was, and and I remember reading in the newspaper it, uh, it, when I was still in college about scientists had noticed the uh, that the Earth's ozone layer was gradually being destroyed because of the CFCs, you know, from cans of hairspray and shaving cream. And, and I think they finally, they stopped using those. And so I think the ozone layer may be in better shape, but, but then there was, the, and around the same time, there was all the discussion about DDT and all these other horrors. So, you know, I became very conscious of, of, of that around, around the same time I was becoming a professional musician. Um, and that, uh, later, my wife and I uh, 
when we were working, we had moved to New York and we were music, uh, working as musicians in New York and, and living in New Jersey. And uh, it was interesting, the state of New Jersey passed a mandatory recycling law. Um, and at the time I was writing music and I was leading a swing band, um, but I registered that recycling was a really good idea. And I decided to call up uh, the people who were starting this recycling program in my town of North Bergen. And I got a job of helping to start the recycling program here. And uh, this led to other environmental activities. Um, I got involved with groups that were uh, fighting the construction of huge garbage incinerators uh, around the state. And, um, and the group I work with now, um, it's called Food and Water Watch. And um, we're trying to prevent all these gas burning power plants from being built that they want to build in all every, every square foot of, of, of the state. Um, so it's been a, you know, I really, really feel an affinity with the, the kind of the environmental musicians who are out there as well. And, and then I, I also might be interesting that I got in, uh, involved in another project, uh, which actually began with a friend of mine, uh, an author named Ian Frazier mm -hmm. uh, and my brother, Tim McClellan. Uh, and this involved the invention of a tool uh, called the bag snagger. Um, and the bag snagger is a, it's a steel hook that you attach to the end of a pole and stick the pole up into the tree uh, that may have a plastic bag in it. Um, and so we started taking plastic bags out of trees, which was something that we uh, we think, you know, in terms of a, of a tool to actually do this, this was the first one of its kind. In fact, we got a patent on it and um, it was, you know, and I actually started a business um, and ran it for several years. Um, we sold the bag snagger to all these different groups like landfill companies around the country that uh, people would complain about all the bags in their trees on the on this landfills and they bought a bunch and um i actually sold one to uh the bet midler who uh had a has a uh, wonderful group in new york city called the new york restoration project that she sponsors and uh for for kids they go around to kind of the lesser attended to parks in the city and she uh bought a bunch of bag snaggers and ended up getting Central Park to buy a bunch. And so I started this business, but, um, and then and this led to the, actually the first time my environmental work and music began overlapping because my brother, Tim, who designed the bag snagger and is a, a wonderful jeweler in Great Barrington, but he is also a lyricist and he wrote, he decided he wanted to write a hymn to the joys of bag snagging and he uh which which he did it's called collect pond and it's about uh kind of collect pond is this little tiny park in down downtown manhattan which we used to clean up all the bags but um and he wrote this hymn and i set it to music and re-recorded it and that one is on my uh, my first recording um but you know uh, you're right, Nick. I've, I've always been drawn, you know, to works that express love or wonder uh, the natural world. And there are a lot of these on uh, the, my Noxos recording. There are three uh, of James Wright poems. Uh, there's one by Mark Van Doren called The Fields of November, uh, the Hart Crane's uh, Garden Abstract. Um, and like in the, in the defective record we just listened to, uh, William Carlos Williams, I found a poem that really showed the anger of someone witnessing environmental destruction, like overbuilding and water and air pollution and, and all the rest. And I just, I love how Tom and Don performing it on the recording, bring out that, bring out that anger in their singing and, and, and playing. Yeah. All right. We've got some comments coming in. Uh, we'll address those soon. Um, but we have uh, some viewers on Facebook really responding to uh, 
this this discussion here. And you brought up Richard Wright, and uh, you really emerge as sort of a champion of this lesser known uh, Midwestern poet on this album, which is uh, really exciting to me. And shout out to Hart Crane for all our viewers in the Midwest, uh, one of the great unsung Midwestern 20th century, you know, poets. Um, but you have this uh, sort of sweet or multi-part piece on the new album out now from Noxus uh, called Five for Piano. And it's the only purely instrumental piece on the record. Um, but we don't necessarily leave the world of poetry behind or leave poetic inspiration behind on that one. Um, you emerge um, as a champion of Richard Wright, but you also sort of set other poets who may not be uh, household names. And I know speaking from just my experience of prepping for this Q and A today, I had a little bit of trouble finding uh, Richard Wright poems online. Um, I had to turn to the printed word. Um, so for the benefit of the audience um, who may not be able to access this poem, uh, I was wondering if you could read um, this poem by Richard Wright um, called The Shadow in the Real. Um, it's the inspiration for um, a movement of this piece, Five for Piano, called Shadow No More, which is drawn from a line of the poem. and. Uh, We'll, we'll hear this poem, which is gorgeous, and then we'll hear your composition based on it shortly thereafter. Does that sound good? That's, that sounds great. I, I, I should say it is, it's actually James Wright. Um, James Wright. Uh, yeah, the, there's a Richard Wright, I believe is, the, is an, another author too, but this is, this is James, they've kind of tricked, but you're right, it's, it's, it's very, you know, they're, well, even the most famous poets <laughs> aren't all that famous, you know. I mean, there's, there's right. poetry is <laughs> it's it's tough. It's uh, it, it's uh, but anyway, I will read. Yeah, I'll read that. This is the second uh, of the piano pieces is uh, called I called it Shadow No More. I kind of paraphrase the titles of the poem, uh, the actual poems, but uh, Wright's poem is called The Shadow and the Real, and. Um, there was no more than shadow where she leaned outside the kitchen door, stood in the sun and let her hair loosely float in the air and fall. She tossed her body's form before her feet and laid it down the wall. And how was I to feel, therefore, shadow no more than darker air? I rose and crossed the room to find her hands, her body, her green dress, but where she stood, the sun behind demolished her from sight and touch. Her body burned to emptiness, her hair caught summer in the light. I sought bewildered for her face, no more than splendid air gone blind. I actually mix, mix, <laughs> messed up one of the lines <laughs> and demolished her from touch and sight. I reversed it, but but it is it just isn't that an amazing poem i mean it's just it's yeah. unbelievable he, he, he was one of the great one of the all time greats i think yeah formally and in terms of the language it's just it's a lot to chew on and a pleasure to chew on and yeah. uh, so now let's hear what you did with this or not what you did with this i guess but um, you know what you drew from it maybe uh, so this is uh, William McClellan's uh, piano piece, Shadow No More, based on um, or inspired by The Shadow and the Real by James A. Wright. Thank you. 
All right, for those of you who may be just joining us uh, near the end of our live Q&A with composer William McClelland, uh, we're still here and we will be here for several more minutes at least uh, talking about this incredible music. Uh, we've just heard uh, this short piano piece called um, Shadow No More. Uh, and William, before that um, musical interlude, uh, we were talking a little bit about um, the sort of poetic inspiration behind that composition. Um, James A. Wright, this undersung Midwestern poet, uh, conjures a really strong mood <laughs> in the poem itself. Um, on the surface, it's about seeing your loved one backlit in bright sunlight and trying to go and find them and see their face. <laughs> But clearly it's about more than just that, right? There's so much feeling in it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of feeling in your poem, in your song too, um, or in the piano piece based on that. Um, and so uh, do you find it freeing in a way uh, to not always have to set text when you're responding to some poem or scene or other artwork? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very very freeing to, to, to do this. Uh, you know, for, for the five for piano, I really made a conscious decision uh, at the beginning that I would not, not set the poems for a singer or singers, um, but that the pieces would be more like instrumental impressions of, of the poetry. Um, it, but at the same time, I did extract lines from the poems and create melodies for them. Um, for example, if you listen to the to the very first musical phrase in, in Shadow No More, the melody in the right hand is a fairly straightforward setting of the first two lines of uh, James Wright's poem. There was no more than shadow where she leaned outside the kitchen door. Uh, it's quite easy to actually hear that in the music. Um, but then after the opening, things become much less strict or the way I did it, and you know, only a few phrases of the poem uh, have what you might call uh, an, a musical equivalent in the piece. Um, and this is how I, I did work in the other other pieces on the the five. Um, they're based on um, poems. The first is based on a E. E. Cummings poem, and then the third uh, one by Edgar Allan Poe, uh, one by Joseph Brodsky, the great uh, Russian American poet, and finally a poem by uh, Robert Burns, the Scotsman, called the, the Jolly Mortals. And um, but I'm so happy you you singled out James Wright. Um, as you noticed, I I not only wrote this piano piece inspired by that incredible poem, but there are two songs uh, on the recording: four voice and piano, uh, which are vocal settings. The earlier one we played called Autumnal, and then another one called uh, Snowstorm in the Midwest. Um, and I, I just think he was a truly great poet. Um, I actually recently completed or nearly completed a work for orchestra in, in which I've, I've done something similar to what, what I've done with these five piano pieces. Uh, the texts um, that inspired me in this piece were actually by Henry David Thoreau, and it's uh, his prose writing. Or, although in Thoreau's case, it's really kind of prose poetry. Um, it's, it's such such poetic writing, and um, I originally thought I'd be setting uh, his his words for chorus or for for a solo voice, but after a number of starts and stops, I. I realized the text just seemed to work so much better in, in that abstract way as more of like a jumping off point for the uh, instrumental music, which is um, which is what I ended up writing. But I mean, yeah, it's it really is 
it's it's fun to 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 do it that way because I just have this connection to the poems. But you don't always want to just you know here's how this line is sung. You know, it's like more how it how it feels and how it how it works on you. Absolutely. So thank you to everyone uh, who is here on Facebook and commenting on our live Q and A with William McClelland. Uh, Raymond Bichet uh, wanted to express uh, his admiration for the term, the term environmental musicians, but also of course, uh, the sort of practice of bringing some of the most important issues of our time into musical expression. And uh, of course, others have just uh, expressed, uh, Catherine King says it's beautiful music, which is true. And uh, you know, some of the most, uh, you know, sort of resonant music for me personally on this album uh, was the choral music. Uh, I don't often respond this strongly to choral pieces. That's just, you know, a, a defect in me, but uh, the choral music stands out on this album for so many reasons. Um, one is the sequencing. Uh, we sort of begin and end and pause in the middle on choral music. Uh, the, the three pieces that you wrote for Chorus also represent some of the oldest poetry um, that is set here. Um, on top of that, uh, many of the texts are of deep personal significance to you. Um, so Hail Lovely and Pure, which we heard a little bit of at the top of this uh, Q&A, is the longest composition on the record, and it's your setting of your own late brother's translation and calligraphy of a Renaissance text. And for those who are interested in picking up this record, um, William has this fantastic um, set of liar notes where some of that calligraphy is actually reproduced, like it's printed in the liner notes. And he explains the genesis of all the pieces. Um, the last piece on the album is called These Last Gifts. Um, and that also addresses the tragic loss of your brother too young and is a luminous and fitting end to the album. And I think to our conversation today as well. Uh, before we listen to it though, uh, what parting thoughts on the course of life would you offer to the audience? And uh, what book of poetry would you recommend they go out and read as soon as they can? Well, thank you so much, Nick. I. I... I guess I could only say that just talking about poetry uh, along with music, um, it really is just one of the most important things in my life. Um, I've been reading it and fascinated by it since uh, I was very young, introduced in you know elementary school. I remember how we how we learned like so many people, Robert Frost's stopping by woods on a snowy evening, you know whose woods these are, and, um, and I remember in seventh grade or early, fifth, fifth or sixth grade, I memorized a poem by Stephen Crane, uh, the great writer who wrote The Red Badge of Courage, but he wrote an amazing poem called War, War is Kind. And um, I memorized that. And, and I remember in seventh, seventh grade, uh, we had a declamation contest and where I learned a long poem by Ogden Nash called Line Up for Yesterday, an ABC of baseball immortals, and and it had this poem had 26 stanzas, uh, all about early baseball players like uh, you know Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb, and he had one player for each letter of 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 the alphabet, and I remember that the teacher, the head of the school, he was a bit, huge baseball fan too, and he thought I should have won this contest, but I I got beat out by uh, a, a, another another student who did a much more you know conventional poem, I think, by uh, John Maysfield or someone you know like. But anyway, I um, but I, just poetry like music is it's just one of the great things that human beings have ever come up with. Uh, it, it would be hard, you know. Well, it's hard hard for me to pick up a book of poetry to recommend, but I guess. Um, a good place to start would be, uh, you know, one like the Oxford Book of American Poetry, or really any, any of the uh, anthologies of American poetry uh, that are out there, or or world poetry. I mean, obviously, <laughs> every country has has 
their own amazing poets, England and every, every, everybody. Um, but as a country, we've produced so many geniuses in this field. And um, I guess I just can't think of a better way to spend one's time than uh, with the work of these, uh, these wonderful poets. Yeah, people, people act like anthologies are inherently boring or something or oh, no. take away the context, but you can experience a lot. I've been reading through this um, anthology of like indigenous American poetry recently, and mm. it's just a, a miracle around every corner or I guess with each turn of the page, but thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you so much, William, for talking thank with you. us and uh, uh, go out and find William's album. Uh, you can find it basically anywhere music streams or is uh, able to be purchased um, in a physical format you know, your archive musics, your Amazons, etc. cetera. Um, and so let's listen before we all depart from this live Q&A uh, to these last gifts, the composition by William McClelland performed by the New York Virtuoso Singers uh, with their conductor, Harold Rosenbaum. Uh, it is an elegy for a lost sibling. And uh, let's listen to it in its entirety and uh, go about your day. Everyone, thank you for tuning in. My 